Thank you, Jennifer. So, it's so good to see you today on Father's Day. I don't know if you remembered, but today is Father's Day. <clears throat> and of course, we have come to worship our Heavenly Father, so that just works out perfectly. Just a nice segue into worship. would like to ask that uh, you would refrain from congregational singing. And as I've mentioned before, I will never know because you have a mask on. But uh, we do want to try to uh, follow the rules as best we can. And we want you to have a worship experience. So, the song that the praise team is singing and playing for you. A great song written in 2011 called Great I Am. And we're talking about the great I am. So uh, please listen attentively as we uh, go to the Father on your behalf and with you. Hear voices of 
Would you bow your heads as we pray? Dear Father, dear Heavenly Father, the good, good Father, the great I Am, we have come today because we want a relationship with you. Lord, we want it to be a good relationship. And Lord, it's been difficult these last few months to uh, continue the worship the way we've known it all along. So we're asking that you would show us each day how we can have that relationship with you, that we can love you, we can pray to you, we can read your word, we can sing to you, we can listen to others proclaim, we can sit and meditate and listen for your still small voice. So Lord, as we continue, we ask that you would use Brother Chuck's words to be your words to touch our hearts. We give this time to you and we pray always in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Amber. Good morning. How are you feeling today? Feeling a little bit overwhelmed by any chance with everything that you hear in the news and what's going on in the world? You know, we're not, we're not done with the, the plague yet. You know that, right? Uh, even though sometimes it feels like there's more cars on the road, there's people moving around, things are going on, it's not over yet. So you still got to wash your hands, wear your mask, keep that six-foot distance, 
you know, anywhere from 6 to 8 to 10 to 12 or, or whatever you need to do. But it's not over yet. And, and you know, we, we are hearing even now maybe more in these days about a racial unrest. It's in the news. You know, it's just, it's just like, it's just like uh, everything else, though. It, it's been with us forever, right? And we tend to see racial unrest come in waves. And we think each time it sort of erupts to the surface that maybe we'll do something about it. This time that we'll, we'll make strides, but it's not over. So we hear that all the time. And then, of course, we're in an election season. That also, as you know, is never over. Nothing about it is over. We're always in the election season, and it's just going to heat up. And for the church, the church is not normal. But then, of course, that's kind of the same as well. We live in a tumultuous, unsettling time. There are competing voices that are disruptive and distracting and divisive. Pretty soon it gets a bit overwhelming. Do you feel that? I, I feel that as I go through the days. Here's what I'd like to suggest to you, that this may be one of the most pivotal moments in our history. This may be a moment that is fraught with opportunity. Yes, indeed, we could be overwhelmed and beaten down and worried and fearful and depressed, or we could at the same time say, you know, this is an opportunity for us to think about things in a different kind of way, to look at where we are in the world. This is a time for the church, I believe, to do some thinking and some reflecting, some pause and evaluating. This is a good time for the church to say, okay, who are we? Where are we? What are we doing now? We can look to the scripture for guidelines in this time because actually most of the scripture was written in tumultuous, difficult, fearful times, which is why so much of it resonates with where you and I live today. So we're going to look this morning at a little bitty letter that Paul wrote to a young pastor as this young pastor was left in a particular place to help um, uh, set up some churches and appoint leaders and to enable the churches and the leaders to do what they needed to be doing there in that place. Paul wrote to Titus, and we're going to look at the little letter of Titus. It's just three chapters. It's actually one of my favorite little books because it's just jam-packed with very specific <clears throat> information that Paul wants to give to this pastor. It's very reminiscent of First and Second Timothy, only with just much more condensed. But we ought to come think about this as we read Titus. Paul writes to this young pastor, and this pastor is living in a place that has a reputation, probably well-earned. Crete was known for being a place where a brutal, wicked people lived. It was kind of considered primitive. It became a metaphor, in fact, for laziness, for lying, for gluttony, for all kinds of wickedness. When people talked about Cretans, well, we sort of, we sort of get it because that even became a phrase that was used in these days. <clears throat> but Paul writes to Titus, and he says, right in the middle of where you are, you have a message that will bring life to these people. And in the midst of a weird and difficult, challenging place, I want to remind you that you have a message to give to these people. So we're reading, and we're going to pick up in Titus chapter Three. <clears throat> so I trust that you have that in front of you. If you'd follow along with me. <clears throat> and this is what Paul says to Titus. Now, he said, he's given all the other instruction. This is his conclusion. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. To malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For, and get this, we also were once foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. But then the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared. He saved us. 
not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed in God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for everyone. Now, avoid, he says, look at verse 9. Avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. Now, I'm coming. I'm going to send Artemis and Tychicus to you and make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way, so that nothing is lacking for them. In verse 14, again, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds, to meet pressing needs, so that they will not be fruitful. What is Paul saying to Titus as he writes to this young pastor, this missionary, this church planter, this guy who's administering a number of churches, what does he say to him in a time that is weird, dangerous, where he is living in a place that is fraught with all kinds of ugliness and brokenness? Number one, he says this. We're going to extract from this text a few things that you and I should hear. This is what Paul says to Titus. Number one, just be calm. Calm down. Just calm, be calm in these moments of yours. He says it here in verse 1. You know, be subject, obey the law, and malign no one. Be peaceable, be gentle. Show every consideration. In other words, this is no opportunity for you to think you're better than everybody else. This is no place for you to be uh, feeling superior and condescending or critical. Remember, you didn't earn your salvation. It's not because you were so great. God in his kindness gave it to you. His mercy, his washing and regeneration and renewing. So, just, just be calm. Calm down. Take a deep breath. Relax. Be secure in his kindness and his love, his eternal life, his Holy Spirit. He's given you all of this. You can, in the midst of all the crazy, you can be calm and not get all wound up. Or you can resist that urge to condemn and criticize, to hurt, to hate, to look down. Stop. He says, just stop. Calm down. And the second thing he says is this, and make some time to be quiet. Be careful what you're listening to. The world, as you know, is a very noisy place. I think because earbuds are ubiquitous, that it's easy to have noise feeding into our brains full tilt. Most people I know who are under the age of, I'm going to say 60, it might be a little bit lower, have it in their hands, their phones all the time, right? And always picking them up, always checking, always making sure, because of course, we're fearful of missing out on something that might come through our phone. The world is very noisy, very demanding. Quiet is rare. And the noise leads to fear, and feeling overwhelmed and not being able to think very clearly and negative impressions and depression, all of that. And Paul is saying to Titus, I just want you to find some time and avoid all the stuff that will clutter your brain. In verse 9, he says, avoid foolish controversies, avoid strife and disputes, unprofitable and worthless kinds of conversation. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk down about social media because that's a broad term that has all kinds of implications. 
And there's some good that comes through social media. It's not all bad. But it is used very often for inflammatory purposes. It does not generally promote thoughtful consideration. I know uh, some, uh, some good millennial friends tell me, oh, no, we have very thoughtful conversation. I read some of those, and I think, hmm, sounds more reactive to me, but, but whatever. It doesn't generally promote thoughtful consideration and reflection. Avoid foolish controversies strifes and disputes. He has said to Timothy twice, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says, avoid worldly empty chatter, which just leads to ungodliness, which leads to arguments. When you go to listen to the news, has anybody found a news outlet that just gives you news? No. Because most news outlets, in fact, all news outlets are designed to do one thing, to sway you a certain way, rather than just providing broad information so that you can think and you can make your own choices. Almost every news outlet, and you know, you can find them way left and way right and everything in between are all designed to sway you someplace, but they're all going to be designed to keep your attention, to keep you coming back, whether it's radio, television, or whatever else you look at. There's all kinds of stuff you can find online. Everything is designed to just fill your brain and fill your heart and fill your soul with all kinds of cluttery noise designed to sway you one way or the other. And Paul says, Titus, same thing he said to Timothy. You guys, calm down and then make some room for quiet. <sighs> Be quiet. Because that's how you're going to hear God. That's how you're going to think through what you read in his book. Listen, make some quiet, and listen to God. Then the third thing is Paul says to Titus, just like he said to Timothy, I want you to calm down. I want you to make some time for quiet. And now in this particular time, I want you to think about what you can do. If you and I look at the church, our church, any church, and we say, it's not like it used to be. It's not normal. When are we ever going to get back? Well, guess what, my friends? We may not get back. We might, or we might not. Even that's an unsettling comment, but it's also should be a challenge for us because you and I should be saying, wow, if we're not getting back to normal, if we're not going to do all the things that we've always done as a church, if we can't do all the things that the senior adults in this church does all kinds of stuff. Senior adults are very active here. This church has very active children's ministry and programs. This church has very active youth ministry and programs, all kinds of stuff going on. But everything went away this year, didn't it? I mean, I'm surprised the world didn't grind to a crushing halt when we canceled VBS. But every church I'm aware of canceled VBS this summer. And you know what? That, that kind of rips our heart out. It just kind of makes us feel empty inside because, wait, that's what we always do. You know, when this fall, I guess school's going to start again. Is school going to start again? Yeah, it's going to start. But we don't know what it's going to look like. It's going to be different, isn't it? Same with church. Things are going to kind of roll along, and we're going to do this for a while, and then we're going to do something else for a while. But it's not going to be quite the same. You know what that means? This is an opportunity. This is the moment. This is what we might call in Greek a kairos moment, a unique moment in time where everything is not quite what it is, what it should be, but it's a moment when anything could happen, and a whole lot of good could happen as well. Yes, indeed. That was my sentiment exactly. That was perfect. Thank you very much. <laughs> I want to do that too. Woohoo! If we, if we can't do what we normally do, then what should we do? And that's the question we should ask. Okay? Be calm. Take a deep breath. Listen, God, what are you saying? And then, okay, if we can't do what we normally do, what then can we do? What then should we be doing? Here's what Paul says to Titus, and he says it three times in this text. In verse 1, he says, be ready for every good deed. In verse 8, he says, be careful to engage in good deeds. Verse 14, our people need to learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs. 
That sounds like exactly what we ought to be doing, only it's going to look different. So we should look at each other. We should look at our community. Already this church is involved in this community in some profound ways. I love to talk about you guys and what you do at the school and in the community and other kinds of ways. But there may be more. There may be a different look. There may be a different shape in the way things look. God willing, there will be a new pastor here and sometime in, in the near future. And what's he going to say when he looks at you and says, okay, what are we doing? And what are you going to say when you say, here's what we're doing. Here's some new things we've thought about. Here are some new ways that we can relate to the community. Here are some new ways we can engage various groups. Here are some ways that we can build on the relationships we've already established. Here are perhaps some new things, some response to the Hispanic community, to the African American community, to the Native Americans, to the Asian community, to the Jewish community. Here are some ways that we can begin to respond that we haven't before. And we've been thinking about this. This is the moment. This is the moment to say, God, since we can't quite do what we normally did, what can we do? What should we be doing? And I think the scripture writers, Paul, would say the same thing to you and me. What can you do now? You and I need to be not fearing that we'll never get back to the way it was. We shouldn't fear that. What we should fear is that we will miss this moment and not make the most of what we could with it. So here's the challenge from the scripture all the way through. Calm down. Take hold of God's kindness. Be secure in him and just rest. Two, be quiet. Find some quiet moments and think and reflect. Read the book and say, God, I'm listening. Here I am. Speak to me. And third, I'm going to challenge you this with this. This week, today, when you have a moment, ask yourself this. What is one way in these days, in these moments, that I can engage in a good deed. What can I do right now for someone nearby, someone next door, someone I see in the community, someone I work, or maybe somebody I don't know at all? What's one way that I can engage in a good deed to meet pressing needs? Let's pray together. Lord, when we come to you often, <clears throat> we simply want to be quiet and listen. So don't let us panic or be overwhelmed. Help us just take a deep breath and rest in you and find life in you. Father, help us to be more concerned about <clears throat> making the most of this moment, not missing this moment, instead of worrying about getting back to whatever normal was. Lord, in these days, help us to listen to you and make time for that. And empower us, strengthen us for good deeds, whatever you might lead us to do. And we'll give you thanks. We'll look forward to what you have in store and we'll trust you in these moments. It is in Jesus, our Savior's name, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Gene. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, this weekend is it, folks. June 27 and 28. You're going to be here with us at Del Norte in view of a call to be our next senior pastor. Uh, we've got a couple of meet and greet sessions scheduled on Saturday, and uh, then he's going to be preaching in three services on Sunday, two drive-in services, and then this service, and we'll be uh, taking the, uh, the ballots voting at uh, the end of each service, and then the results will be announced at the end of this service. So, if you can... Please be here. Uh, 
that's about it. It's going to be an exciting weekend. Thank you. If you have misplaced your little document that gives the times for Saturday and Sunday and has uh, a, a resume, they're right there on that table on your way out. We do have green buckets. Those are our offering buckets. If you'd like to drop off an offering or a note, if you have something uh, that you would like to give for Lillian Moon, our children's minister, her last Sunday is July 12. We're collecting cards, and we're going to put those together and give those to her on July 12. You can give those to a staff member or put it in a green bucket or mail it to the church, and we'll make sure that she gets all of those on July 12. Did I say July 12? All right. So good to see you guys. It's good to see these North Carolina folk right down here in the front. All right. Well, you guys have a fabulous week. We hope to see you next Sunday. Bye-bye.